Let's pray as we get started. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what is in it. Uh, specifically, God, as we talk today about marriage and relationships, God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the truth that is in your word. Um, help us, God, because I know relationships is, is a tough thing. Um, God, more pain in our life has been caused through relationships than probably anything else. But God, we know you created it. It was your idea, and you want us to have successful marriages, God. And so I pray as we open up your word, you would help us to not only see that and understand that, but then live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. So how we doing? We good? Good, good. Y'all are a little fired up. That's good. I just got to tell you, uh, you know, we just got back from uh, Kenya. We got back Friday. We're supposed to get back like 3 p.m., but didn't get back to 11 p.m. And so I'm like half asleep still, so I just need you to know that. I may not make co coherent sense, so be patient with me. Um, but it was a great trip, and we'll be talking more about it over the next few weeks, um, just talking about all that God did. Um, but just some amazing experiences as a team from Revolution Church went. Uh, everybody on the, on the trip was from Revolution, and we just got to see what God is doing there and through our partnership with Serve International. It's pretty amazing. Um, but as we were going and coming back, obviously traveling, you know, that's, it's tough. Um, and, and like I said, I, I want to do my best today. But probably the best experience that we had there was just meeting the Kenyan people, especially believers, and how interactive they were and how joyful they were. So if you want to help me today, be excited, be joyful. They love to say amen over there. It's awesome. Um, so don't be afraid. Yeah, come on now. All right. All um, right. We, we would go to different villages and, and, and literally, just as was their custom, they're introducing themselves, we're introducing ourselves like, amen, amen, like everybody's just getting after it. And so that is typical kind of what a Kenyan pastor does, amen, 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 right? It just kind of builds. And so if you hear me saying that, just follow with me, all right? That, that'll help me. That'll help me get through the message. All right, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. But we are in this series called House United and talking about the objective of family development that we laid out last year. We have five objectives as a part of Multiply that we want to see accomplished in the life of our church. One is spiritual development. That's why we did the whole series at the beginning of the year, fasting, praying. This one is family development, trying to help us create strong families because we believe the church is only as strong as our families. And so the first week we talked about how a divided house falls. And so we all have to make a decision to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then last week I heard Pastor Jordan did a great job talking about family discipleship when we talk about parents and how we are to bring our children up in the Lord. And then I heard the parent night went well as well. Several hundred of you came out for that to learn more about parenting. Maybe you are a parent, future parent, whatever it was. But we're doing that because we wanna help uh, accomplish this objective. And, and not just for family, but we've got two coming up. One you already heard about on Church News. Uh, we've got a financial learning experience coming up in March. I want to highly encourage all of you to sign up for that. Uh, it's a great, we've done this several times over the years. And several hundred people come out every time to learn how budgeting. And a lot of it may seem boring to you, but I'm telling you, it's important. Especially when we talk about marriages and family. So you want to make sure you sign up for that. And then lastly, in May... On the 5th of May, which is a Saturday, it's Cinco de Mayo, we're having a marriage conference that we're just calling Cinco de Marriage, all right? Um, so I want to highly recommend that you sign up for that as well. Both of those events are on our website. Just go to events.revolution.church, and you can sign up for both of those events. I would, again, we'll talk more about it as they get closer, but I just want you to know those two things as we talk about these objectives as a church that we're trying to accomplish. All right, now if you have a Bible, open it up to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be uh, this week and next week, looking at arguably the greatest text on marriage in the Bible. Arguably the greatest text on marriage, one that just really kind of lays out what God's will is for marriage. But I just want to say a, a little bit of a disclaimer here that I know anytime we talk about marriage, all kinds of emotions are, are raised by that. Because there are people that are single and wish they were married, and then there are people who are married and think that they wish they might be single, right? Then we have divorce, then we have remarriage and divorce, and you know, I mean, all kinds of dynamics when we talk about marriage. And so I just want to say, by no means in one sermon can I solve 
every situation or every scenario. But what I want to do is give us some practical handles. Even if you're single and not married, I want you to better understand how to be successful so that if one day you get married or maybe you don't get married, which is totally fine. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. You'll still have practical wisdom on how to do relationships, all right? But if, especially if you are married, depending upon how long you've been married, we can very easily just kind of get into some rhythms that just aren't healthy. And so I'm hoping over this week and next week, we can all take some objective look at our own relationships, married, not married, whatever it is, and learn from what the scriptures talk to us about. But what we're going to do in Matthew chapter, or not Matthew chapter five, I told you, you got to hang with me. All right. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, not Matthew 5. I'm sure Matthew 5 is great too. But Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 15. Now, the typical marriage talk starts in verse 22. And we'll get into that next week as it talks about the role of husbands and wives. But I think it's important to start in verse 15 to understand context as we think about marriage. And I think there's some great practical principles here in Ephesians 5 verse 15 through 21 that we're going to look at that a lot of times doesn't get related to marriage or we don't think about marriage when we're looking at these texts, but it's the precursor to what he's talking about marriage. So I think it fits perfectly. All right. So let's go verse 15 in Ephesians chapter five. Paul says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now let's talk for a little bit about that. First, he says, look carefully at how you walk. The phrase there, how you walk, means how you behave. Literally, how you carry yourself. You act a certain way. You carry yourself a certain way. Now that's true Again, regardless of marriage, we all have a certain way that we act, a certain way we behave, but I want us to think specifically about it in marriage. And I want us to think like this. When it comes to how you carry yourself in your marriage, how you behave in relationships, what is your posture like? How do you carry yourself? Paul says to think about that, to carefully examine, to observe, to look at how you walk, to see, man, am I walking wisely? Am I carrying myself wisely or am I carrying myself unwisely? Again, this is true regardless of if we're married or not, but I think it's especially true when it comes to marriage because all of us carry ourselves a certain way in our relationships. But here's why I want us to start here. Most marriage problems occur when one person is willing to point out the flaws in the other, but not themselves. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. Amen, right? Men, it's okay to amen that too. You're not gonna get in trouble for that one later, all right? I heard this week that the difference between married men and unmarried men is they both have problems. Married men just find out about them sooner, right? <laughs> amen, right? But when it comes to marriage and relationships, again, the worst thing that we can do is to just point out the flaws of the person next to us and not start with ourselves. Again, a lot of people today are going to listen to this message and be like, he needs to hear this. <laughs> listen, I'm not saying he doesn't. But what I'm saying is you do too. Why? I'm, I'm liking this, yeah, I'm liking this. I'm feeling at home, man. Like I'm, again, I've been in Africa for two weeks, so I feel foreign right now, all right? But a lot of times, we fail to look at ourselves. We fail to observe how we carry ourselves. But I want you to understand a principle, and this is gonna be not good English, but it's great theology. It's great understanding. You take you wherever you go. Let me say it again. You take you wherever you go. Now, I know that's like earth-shattering thought, right? But here's the problem. If you have a trail of drama in relationships in your life, the common denominator in all of those is you. We take you wherever you go. 
And so the first place to start, the first place to start is with ourselves, is to look at how we are walking, to look at how we are living, to observe how I carry myself as it relates to my spouse, or if I'm not married, as it relates to just people I'm in relationship with. Paul says, look carefully at how you walk, not as, wise, as unwise, but as wise. That word there, wise, is the Greek word sophos, and the, and the Greek word for unwise is asophos, and anytime you add a prefix a to a word, it means the opposite. So think about it like this. In English, we talk about amusement parks or being amused. Well, amuse is the opposite of muse. Muse means to think. Amuse means I don't want to think. Just entertain me, right? Just amuse me. I don't want to think. So that's why we go to movies. That's why we go to theme parks. Unless you go to Disney and you better think and have an app or you're not going to enjoy your time there, right? Go to vacation, then you need a vacation from your vacation when you go to Disney, right? All of you that are in Disney watching live, hello, good to see you. <laughs> but the idea here of unwise is juxtaposed to wise. What he's saying there is a lot of us are acting the opposite. We're not acting wisely. And, and if we're not acting wisely, then we're acting unwisely. We're acting foolishly. And then he says this, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You want to know what the will of the Lord is? It's for us to act wisely. It's for us to look carefully at ourselves and live out the wisdom that he gives us in the scriptures. So God has a will for your marriage. God has a will for relationships. And when we talk about will, what we're saying is what God wants to happen. What God dreams of happening, what God created to happen. And so when we think about our marriage and the will of God, what I want you to see is God has a will for how you carry yourself, how you carry yourself when it comes to marriage. So let me give you my point. Here's what God's will is. Okay, what is his will? How, how am I supposed to carry myself? Let me give you the point, and then I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures. Here's my point. In marriage, we must embrace the posture paradox. Let me say that again. In marriage, we must embrace the posture paradox. Now, the word paradox means in a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement that when you look into it, it proves true. So let me say it like this. A paradox is something that we think is mutually exclusive. They cannot exist together, but when you look at it, they really can. And so the posture paradox, the seemingly absurd statement that we're going to see here in, in Ephesians chapter five is God saying these two things, you think they don't go together, the two types of posture that you think don't fit together, they do fit together and that's my will for you. I want these two seemingly contradictory things to come together. Now, when I was flying to Africa. We flew first to Germany and then had a layover in Germany. And then we flew to Nairobi, Kenya. And this was like two weeks ago, not this last Monday, but the Monday before that. So we were, you know, it was a 12 day trip. And when you fly that far, you're in a big plane and they provide amusement options, right? They provide entertainment in the seat back in front of you is a TV screen and you can watch movies. So our first flight was like eight or nine hours, and then with a couple hour layover, and then another eight or nine hour flight. So we had time to watch some movies. And I also had time to work on my sermon, right? I mean, I was spent like 40 hours on a plane in two weeks. And so I was working on my sermon and really just thinking, okay, God, what do you want me to say? What do you, what do you want me to talk about when it comes to marriage? And so as I was thinking through that, kind of working on it, I needed a mental break and so I decided to watch a movie. Now, whenever you watch a movie on a plane, I gotta be honest with you, I'm a little unnerved by that. Because I'm watching a movie that I've never seen before, and there's like 500 of my closest friends around me that 
if a scene comes up in a movie that I'm like sitting there watching the movie, you know, eating whatever the peanuts that they give you and stuff. I mean, you get a little bit more on international flight. And then this scene is like, oh, you like finding the throw up bag to cover the screen because you didn't know, like, especially on this trip, it's all 12 people from Revolution Church. Like, what is Pastor Jason watching, right? (laughs) And so these are like all the thoughts in my head. So I'm scanning through the movies, trying to find a good one. And I found one that came up that I thought was going to be a comedy called Eddie the Eagle. Now, I don't know if you've seen this movie, but it is a fantastic movie. I started telling people about it. Other people started watching on the plane. And then at the end, they're like, I'll be honest, I teared up. I'm like, I did too, man, you know? But I'm watching this movie, and it's about a guy, true story. And, you know, the Olympics are going on right now. It's about a guy who grew up not very athletic at all. In fact, he had some problems with his legs, and he just dreamed of being an Olympian. And so he would try a bunch of different sports, was never quite good enough, and he grew up in the UK, in Britain. And so they weren't really known for their ski jumping, and so they didn't have a ski jumping team, and so he figured out that if he could just make a successful jump, he'd be on the team, because he'd be the only person on the team. And so he kind of starts out on this trek to be a ski jumper. Now, ski jumping is the one where they go down those big slides on the side of a mountain, and then take off and then go land. That's not a sport that you just kind of go into lightly, right? So it's a true story. He's going, he actually makes it to the Olympic team. I don't want to spill, spoil the whole movie for you. But there's one part early on in the movie, and Hugh Jackman's in it. That right there will probably, oh, okay, I'll watch it now. Um, <laughs> and Hugh Jackman is this old Olympian who's, you know, washed up, and he kind of coaches Eddie. And there's one part in the movie that as I'm watching it, I was like, oh, I pressed pause, rewinded like five times. I'm like, that's the message right there. And that's just how God works. God's just amazing like that. On a plane, headed to Germany, watching Eddie the Eagle, and this message is born, right? People say, how do you, you know, write the message? I, say, I read the Bible and just listen to the Lord, right? So I'm listening to this, and I'm like, oh, that's it. That's the paradox that Ephesians 5 talks about. And in the movie, and I'm going to illustrate this for you for your amusement, all right? Um, In the movie, Hugh Jackman is telling Eddie that when you go down the hill, the foundation of any good jump is is the takeoff. And at the takeoff, when you're jumping, he says this. He calls it the jumping paradox. The jumping paradox. And then he goes on to describe it. He says, simultaneously... And again, I'll illustrate this for you. So they're going to, Lindsay said I should have had skis. Maybe if I wasn't out of the country, I would have had them. So they're going down the hill, right? They're kind of leaning back like this. And if you've seen them, they got the helmet and all the the outfit on. And they're going down super fast, whether it's the 70 meter or the 90 meter. And so they're going down. And then at the takeoff, Hugh Jackman says, you simultaneously stretch up and lean down simultaneously you put your body going two directions, up, leaning up, stretching up, and leaning down. And then he says this, it's unnatural. Because you actually take off downward. But he says when you stretch up and lean down, it gives you the wings of a bird and enables you to fly. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, that's it. That's the paradox of marriage. Simultaneously having a posture. Remember posture, how you carry yourself. Simultaneously have a posture of stretching up and leaning down. Now let's look back at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and see if that's biblical. Look at what Paul says. Again, a lot of times we don't think about this as it relates to marriage, but I think it's perfect because it's the setup for the role of husbands and wives. Look at verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now look at verse 20 and 21. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
So simultaneously, I want you to see this. In marriage, we must embrace the posture paradox of simultaneously stretching up and being filled with the Holy Spirit and leaning down and submitting to one another. Let me say that again. In marriage, we must embrace the posture paradox of simultaneously stretching up, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and leaning down. Now let's talk about these two things. First, stretching up. He says, don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That always kind of tripped me out a little bit because Paul is describing being filled with the Holy Spirit with drunkenness. You're like, how in the world is that, you know, talk about a paradox. Those are mutually exclusive things. But Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. Now, the word debauchery means the way you act when you're not thinking. Literally, the definition is what one does when the mind is absent. Why is that true when it comes to getting drunk? Well, because when you get drunk, I know none of you understand this principle, but when you get drunk, you are no longer in control. Your mind is now absent because you are under the control of a substance outside of yourself that you have taken in and filled yourself up with. Now, the Bible doesn't say it's a sin to drink. It does clearly say it's a sin to get drunk. But Paul is using this as a principle to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why would he do that? Here's why. Being filled with the Spirit, being full of the Holy Spirit operates on principle the same way getting drunk does. What do I mean by that? You have a substance or a person outside of yourself that you have taken in and you are drunk on and they are now in control. That's what he's saying about the Holy Spirit. Don't give over control to alcohol or drugs because that is debauchery that never leads to wise things, but give up control to the Spirit. Give up control of your life to the Holy Spirit. So what that means is this. A successful marriage first is found when you find your happiness in the Spirit, not in your spouse. Let me say it again. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> A successful marriage is found when you and I, we get full on the Holy Spirit and therefore our happiness is in him, not in our spouse. See, a lot of us, we get married for ourselves, And this is just the air we breathe in 21st century America. We get married for you to make me happy. We don't get married to lose ourselves. We get married to, like Jerry Maguire says, complete ourselves. And what the biggest lie Hollywood has ever produced, right? A human being can never fulfill a role that God himself was intended to fulfill. That's just the truth, right? Yeah. So the first key to a successful marriage is finding yourself in the spirit. Not in your spouse. Finding your happiness, your joy, everything about who you are, your identity in Christ. That's what he says. Be filled with the Spirit. Because when you are filled with the Spirit, then you will sing like the Spirit. So it's interesting. And again, I never thought about this in terms of marriage, but I think it's interesting. We just think, you know, sing songs and church, spiritual songs, hymns, make melody, all that. Yes, that's true. But let me say it to you like this. In your marriage, what kind of song are you singing over your spouse? Because the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what kind of melody are you making in your marriage? See, melody is a... Let me, let me give you the definition of this because I'm not a musician. I just want to make sure I get it right so that all of our artists don't be like, that's wrong. All right. <laughs> Melody is a sequence of single notes that is musically satisfying. A sequence. 
of single notes that's musically satisfying. You can tell when there's a good melody. But I think a lot of times in marriages, we don't have a good melody because we don't have a sequence of notes that's musically satisfying because you got two people trying to find themselves in themselves and in the other. So a lot of times the songs that we sing over our spouse and over our marriage, the music that our marriage is making is more like, oh, my achy, breaky heart, (laughs) right? I'm not even gonna try to sing it. (laughs) Thank you, yeah. Because it wouldn't be musically satisfying, right? (laughs) But think about it. What makes for good melody is when two people are in sync. I'm not talking about the band in sync. All right, let me clarify there. What makes for good rhythm, for good melody, is when two people are both filled with the Spirit. Two people both are finding in God what only God can do for them. And so therefore the song that they're singing over their spouse, over their marriage, is one of service to the other. Not of fulfillment in the other. So let me ask you a question. What comes out of your mouth as it relates to your spouse? What comes out of your mouth? What what kind of melody is your marriage making? If it's not musically satisfying, if it's not, let me say it like this, mutually satisfying, then it's out of sync. Well, how does that happen? It's because we haven't embraced the posture paradox. The first part, remember, is stretch up, be filled by the Spirit, and what's the second one? Simultaneously lean downward. Paul says it like this, submit to one another. You want to know what the word submit means? To place yourself under. To place yourself under. See, here's the paradox. Simultaneously, we have to lift up to God and lean down to others. When we were in Africa, we rode around in land cruisers, and that's actually where land cruisers were made for. They weren't made for 575. They were actually made for, you know, the bush in Africa. So we're going all over northwest Kenya, southwest Kenya, and, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, not roads, just making roads, and I was like, these are amazing vehicles. But when we were at the very end, we were in southwest Kenya, and we were uh, at a reserve, you know, looking at animals and stuff, This Land Cruiser that we had twice broke down. Once, I think something was wrong with the starter, and you could tell that the driver didn't really know what, it wasn't very mechanically involved. And the first time it broke down, we were kind of in the bush, and we were literally like 14 feet away from a pride of lions. Yeah. And there were 14 or 15 lions there. You got the one male lion and all the female lions, lionesses, and then the cubs. And, and we pulled up to be like, hey, get close to get pictures. And he turns the vehicle off, first mistake. And um, <laughs> then when he starts to turn it back on, just clicking. Like the starter is not, so now he's freaking out because you don't get out of the vehicle when you're that close to lions. So we're just praying, come on, Lord. I mean, <laughs> you gotta start this vehicle. We're all freaking out, like, what are we gonna do, Lord? And like, you run that way, the rest of us run this way, right? And um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of what I'm thinking. Eventually, it starts up, he cools down, and, and we leave, and so problem solved. A couple days later, we're driving out again, and this time, we get a flat tire. Now, mind you, we were 14 feet away from some lines the first time, so it's, you're not supposed to get out of the vehicle. Well, now we got a flat tire, so we got to get outside the vehicle. So the driver's freaking out. So me and Tim Brenner, who was on the trip, he serves with uh, student ministry, has for a long time. We jump out and we help the driver start change the, changing the tire because, again, he didn't really know what was going on. And, I mean, we were NASCAR in that mug, trying to get the, up in the air as fast as we could, get the tire off, right? I told Tim later, we should have timed ourselves to see, you know, how long it took us. But, but we got it changed. And there's two tires on the back because you've got to have more than one. And so we, we changed the tire. But in order to change the tire, we had to get below the vehicle. 
and lift it up. We had to go low in order to lift up. And my wife and a couple other girls were behind us. And so I said, hey, I apologize already if you see plumbers crack, all right? I got, but I got to get down low to fix this tire. Well, thankfully, by God's grace, we fixed it, didn't get eaten, and we got back in the vehicle and left. But again, I thought about this verse. That is a picture of submitting to one another. Submission is, by definition, getting underneath in order to lift someone up. Why? To change out so that you can go in a new direction. That is the second part of the paradox of the posture we're supposed to have. Simultaneously stretching up receiving power from the Holy Spirit, receiving affection, receiving identity from God, and simultaneously bending down and submitting ourselves to one another. Taking the role of a servant. Taking the role of thinking, I am here to serve you. You are not here to serve me. That, my friends, is the posture paradox simultaneously stretching up while at the same time leaning down into your descent because you actually take off downward. A lot of times the reason why we don't have fulfilling, satisfying, successful marriages is because we get the takeoff wrong. So we're flying through the air not realizing that we're heading for a crash because we didn't get our posture right in the beginning. So what Hugh Jackman said, the foundation of any good jump is the takeoff, this paradox. But here's what's amazing. That's exactly the same posture that Jesus took towards us. You can turn there if you want, but I'm just gonna read quickly from Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two, if you wanna turn there just to your right, not very far from Ephesians. Chapter two, verses one through seven, it says this about Jesus. It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, I highlighted that one, talking about the first part of the, the, the uh, paradox, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, which means go low, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Verse five, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, means he was equal with God. That's what his form was did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, that means held on to, but emptied himself by taking the form of a what? Servant, being born in the likeness of men. I want you to see this. Simultaneously, Jesus embraced the posture paradox. There was no one higher than him, because he's God, but no one went lower than him at the same time. He was in the form. That word form is used twice, same exact word. He was in the form of God and he was in the form of a servant. Simultaneously, at the same time, Jesus was the relationship paradox. And here's what Paul's saying to us. You wanna know what God's will is for you? Take the same posture that Jesus took. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and treat yourself like a servant to your spouse by submitting yourself to them. But I want you to hear me. Just like Hugh Jackman said, Jackman said, this is unnatural for you. What is natural? What's natural is to exalt yourself. To, yeah, lift. I'm all good with God as long as God exalts me. I'll... I'll I'll worship God. This is a lot of how Americans think. I'll worship God as long as God does what I want him to. 
gives me success in every area of my life. But, but take the form of a servant? No, why would I do that? Jesus embraced the paradox. And the Bible says in Philippians, that's why there is no name greater than his. And at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Why? Because your greatness is shown by your willingness to be a servant. And Jesus, who was and is God, went all the way down, the Bible says, to death on a cross for you. And we'll see this next week, but Ephesians 5 is going to tell us that our marriage is a symbol of Christ's relationship with his church. So you want to know the key to a successful marriage? Embrace this paradox like Jesus did. Simultaneously stretching up and bending down. Serving your spouse. But again, this is where you would say, but, but you don't understand, they don't serve me. Don't start with them. Start with yourself. Observe your posture towards your spouse. What's amazing is this. If you've got two people that are trying to outdo each other in service, guess what? You'll have a happy and fulfilling marriage. You want to know the times in my 16 years of marriage where we got off track? It's when one of us were being driven more by selfish ambitions instead of selfless ambitions. So the paradox of the posture that you and I must embrace if we are ever to have a shot at successful marriages is to relate to our spouse, our future spouse, the same way that Jesus relates to us. He served us. He saved us. And if you'll humble yourself, he will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, James says he opposes you. So look at yourself. How do you carry yourself? What's your posture? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and your grace in our life. A word like this is challenging, but we know it's true. Because we know, Lord, whenever we've gone after selfish ambition, it has destroyed relationships. And our love for you is ultimately proved by our love for others. So if we're not willing to go low and humble ourselves and lift others up, then we're not as much in love with you as we thought. We're not filled as much as we thought with the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is always going to lead us in one direction, and that is downward, in service to others. Because Jesus said in John that the Holy Spirit was only going to tell us what Jesus had said. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to not only remind us what Jesus said, but make us like what Jesus was. So thank you, God, that he loved us enough to serve us and to save us and to die for us. And I pray right now, God, if anybody in the house or listening has never trusted Christ, has never understood that the God of all creation came to earth, took on the form of a servant, and died a sinner's death on a cross to exalt them out of death, I pray right now, God, you would save them. Nobody looking around or talking here as we close. If you've never trusted Christ, if you've never realized that God loves you so much that he served you, not to exalt you, but through him for you to be exalted, to be like him. He's, he's not here to make you more what you envisioned yourself to be. He's here to make you more like Jesus. And that happens by first trusting him to save you. So if you want to trust Christ for the first time, be saved. 
I'm gonna ask you to pray with me to yourself, not out loud, not trying to embarrass you. It's between you and God. But it goes like this. Pray, God, thank you for loving me that you sent your son as a servant to give his life for me. I ask you to save me, forgive me. I give you my life. I die to myself. Thank you for loving me. Now, nobody looking around or talking, but if you just prayed that, would you just simply lift your hand up so we can see that? Thank you. Thank you. We got men and women walking around, going to put a gift in your hand, some Bible, some other stuff. When they do that, you can put your hand down. But then those of us in the house or listening online, if you know Christ, if you would say today that you are saved, but you're not willing to take the role of a servant towards your spouse or towards anybody else for that matter, then the Bible says you are contrary to God's will. But you can confess that and repent and from this day forward live wisely, redeem the time, make the most of what you have. And that happens by embracing this paradox of finding your significance in Christ and serving others as though they were yourself. So if you've trusted Christ, but your posture is wrong, let's get that fixed today. Maybe you need to apologize to your spouse or to someone else and say, you know what, I haven't had the right posture towards you. I'm here to serve you. And I promise you, you watch what the Holy Spirit does. God, I thank you for your word. We ask for it to come true in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.